Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Geek Warning Podcast from the Escape Collective, your one-stop shop to bring you up to speed on what's happening this week in the world of bicycle tech. In this week's show, we're going to talk about the new giant TCR and how much its design may or may not have been perhaps overly influenced by the wants and needs of pro bike racers instead of everyday enthusiasts. We're going to talk about how the new Specialized Epic may be the exact opposite. We're also going to chat about whether electronic smart suspension makes sense for mountain bikes, big business changes at Trek, and the importance of a good brand name, why the next addition to your home workshop might not actually be a bicycle tool, and a whole bunch of fresh product news from Industry 9, Scott Physique, and Posedla. I'm James Huang. That's obviously a big list of stuff. And today it's, well, it's just me and senior tech editor Dave Rome in Sydney, Australia to go through it all. Hi, Dave. Hello. Uh, Good to see you, James. Good to see you too. It's good to be back. Mm. I've definitely been on the road a fair bit lately and it's nice to be sitting in my living room for once. Mm. Yes, yes. Nothing to add. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's good because like I say, we've got a big long list of topics to get through today. So we're going to kind of dispense with the idle chit chat. uh, But first, uh, it sounds like we've got a little bit of a quick corrections corner to, to tackle here. What's up? Yeah, last week we had uh, on our mind and uh, discussed uh, whether whether like uh, bicycling or cycling is turning into the sort of automotive car dealership model where uh, products are locked into being serviced only by the verticals of that brand. And uh, I made some comment that uh, I really wish Trek would publish their manuals online and not keep them to their dealers only. And it turns out they do. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm I'm quite confident they didn't used to, but nowadays, yeah, if you go onto the model uh, of the bike, there's actually a service tab on their website, and then you can find the, the actual service manual of that bike, which sort of shows you, you know, uh, torque settings and pivot layouts and uh, cable routing and all that and the part numbers required. So apologies to Trek, you you actually do exactly what I uh, I, I asked you to do. <laughs> I was just uh, going to say, so, so not only are those manuals there, but they're also exactly where you'd expect them to be. Yep. Yep, yep. Uh, they they weirdly don't come up in a Google search, but uh, anyway, that's that's a me problem rather than a Trek problem. So Trek, yes, I, I do owe you an apology, but uh, I would say there's still some information that I've seen from Trek uh, through dealers that isn't available publicly, uh, which kind of still sticks to the point we're discussing. So, uh, but I'll leave it there, and yeah, I will say Trek are uh, not necessarily one of the bad examples, given that they do offer the said service manuals. Hmm. Okay. Well, Dave, shame on you, Dave. Shame on you. If I, I, know, s- I know. smack your knuckles with a ruler right now, if I could. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <That> escalated. <laughs> M- moving into our news and discussion topics for today. First up, uh, Giant just announced the tenth generation of its, I'd say, super popular TCR range of road racing bikes, and uh, a whole bunch of folks, myself included, wondered if Giant might go the kind of ultra lightweight route here to go head to head against the Specialized Athos, which is also proven to be a super popular bike. Uh, but instead, Giant took the arguably more conservative option and tried to maintain a kind of a more competition minded personality to it. Uh, bike's lighter than it used to be. Medium frames now is supposedly just under 700 grams. Uh, it's a few watts more aero. Giant finally caved in the whole hidden cable routing thing. So no, nothing super surprising. Same exact geometry right down to the millimeter. Top end one still has an integrated seat mast. Still press fit 86 bottom bracket shell. Tire clearance is pretty modest at 33 mil. Maybe could have been a little better there. It's still very much intended to be a road racing bike. Uh, and that's apparently due in large part because this is what some of the company's sponsored pros wanted. Uh, so even though aero bikes are definitely still faster most of the time, I was told that there are times that racers sometimes just want something that's pretty aero, but just really, really light and really, really stiff. Um, so yeah, it's basically the same flavor of TCR as it's been. Uh, but it now kind of occupies what I would say is sort of like this weird middle ground between a crazy light bike and an aero one. And what I'm wondering is... If this makes sense, when the vast majority of people buying a TCR will never actually be in a race at all, let alone one that's UCI sanctioned. Uh, I mean, it makes sense as far as every other brand sells a bucket load of uh, race bikes that are not well suited to the consumers buying them. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is to me, this is a, a larger problem across the industry, as as I think you agree, James, which is... Uh, yeah, the geometry of a lot of these race bikes are not are not the ideal option for for most people, uh, and I think a lot of people would be better off on 
more endurance style bikes, but it's just not as uh it's not as sexy to buy that style of endurance bike that everyone wants to be on the bike they see their pros ride. Uh and we end up in this circular this mouse wheel of yeah, brands wanting to make uh competing race bikes for their teams and then people wanting to buy them and it kind of just reinforces the problem. Yeah, when I was at that launch event in Taiwan, uh, I, I wish I could remember who I was talking to, but it was another either media or, or industry person. And they brought up this idea that a lot of this is not only due to the UCI having pretty strict technical regulations on what bikes can be in UCI sanctioned events, but just also the rule that bikes used in competition at that level also have to be offered for sale. Yeah. So let's say so let's say the UCI did still have rules, technical rules regarding what bikes could be that are used in UCI sanctioned competitions, which I think there should be regulations. You don't want it to be to be just like an absolute free for all, I guess. Um, but if you got rid of the idea that bikes used in competition had to be offered for sale, mm. Would that create some separation between bikes that are best suited for that level of competition versus bikes that are more appropriately suited for kind of amateur use? I mean, and I, and I want to kind of, I guess, hedge a little bit here because I do want to say that there are an awful lot of people for whom a proper race bike is the sure. right bike for them, is the bike that they want. Yes. Yeah. But it still doesn't seem to me like that should be the overarching set of rules determining what is a bike for consumers yeah no i think you're right i think at that point there'd just be pure marketing value in brand building for for brands to be keep competing in the world tour rather than trying to sell the exact bike that's being raced it would be all about trying to raise the profile of the brand being raced uh and i think there's an element of that happening now but predominantly i think they're actually trying to sell the bike being raced and they're trying to sell off the bike uh, and yeah, it would completely change the story and, you know, it's kind of moves more to the, almost like the F1 model of things where, you know, Formula One cars are not being sold, but the brands competing in Formula One are certainly trying to sell their cars uh, and sell the allure of the car brands off of it. So yeah, uh, I think there's room for such flexibility in the sport and I think it would probably be a good thing long term to to make that separation. So let me kind of toss something your way. As I said, you know, Giant obviously made the decision that it made with this 10th generation TCR. But uh, in talking with their product team, one of the things that came up, or one of the thing, things that they told me anyway, is that they essentially had boiled down the possibility for this 10th gen bike into one of two directions. It could either be still a very lightweight, but also aero bike, um, or it could just be like flat out lightweight, period kind of more like the Athos, and they obviously went with the aero and lightweight thing. Um, but given how popular that Athos has been, and yeah. you know, we never see it in racing, and that's something that Specialized made clear right from the get-go, um, because specifically because it's not aero at all, and it's mm -hmm. arguably too light in a lot of, in a lot of the situations. Um, but so right now, this TCR is 690 grams unpainted for a medium. And from what I understand, it could have been closer to like 650, maybe closer to 600 even possibly. So yep. imagine you had something that was closer to an Athos yep. in terms of overall weight, still had the convenience of that partially external cable riding, and maybe also had a little bit slightly more toned down geometry in terms of fit and handling that was maybe not quite Defy-like. Um, but you know, like one common complaint that a lot of people have had with the a list for people who do have complaints with that bike is that the front end is just too low. Yeah. Um, for a bike that for people that are looking for just a really nice road bike, a common complaint I've had. <laughs> yeah. They, they don't necessarily either have the desire or the flexibility to, to yeah. take full advantage of that low stack up front. Yeah. Well, yeah. Every Athos I've seen has spaces above the head tube, even with very fit and athletic young people riding them so that kind of is telling that most of the population that could afford that bike would benefit from a taller stack yeah yeah so like it's uh, i think it you know i only rode that bike for a couple of days in taiwan uh the bike is fantastic to ride i mean almost particularly with those new kdex wheels that they have on there which really makes me and several other people that i talked to wonder how much of the difference is the new wheels and tires versus the frame 
Uh, so maybe I'll find out at some point. Um, but yeah, I just I I'm very curious to see how many of the Jayco Alula team actually use the TCR in competition this mm. season. And I just can't help but wonder what could have been. Yeah. I I mentioned this on last week's podcast that I had kind of hoped that Giant would kind of stick it to the rest of the industry and stick with external cable routing and do that lightweight bike, kind of compete, create a, a, a more value-oriented competitor to the ethos. Uh, and with, you know, Giant's track record and reliability and and all that and i think that could have been a very good bike and basically what you just described there like a bike with ever so slightly more relaxed geometry in terms of stack and reach figures uh almost as light as an ethos just as convenient to service i seriously think that would have been one of the best selling road bikes on the market uh as the ethos has become for as my understanding i believe the ethos is a very strong selling bike for specialized uh and it it kind of blows my mind that other brands haven't followed with offering something in that more traditional area for, for people that want it. So yes, it's a shame. The other thing I keep coming back to with this new TCR is the Propel was already a very lightweight aero race bike. And it rides pretty well too. It rides well. I'm wondering at what point or what situations the team would choose the TCR over the Propel if say the yates uh which yeah adam adam yates simon uh, yates? i don't know <laughs> simon <laughs> yates <laughs> so he's he's on a you know he's he's not tiny but he's on a small enough bike i'm pretty sure his propel is right near that 6.8 kilogram mark as it is the the uci's limit so i question like what the tcr might be 150 grams lighter as a complete bike ish if that Something like that. You know, I, I posed that very question to Giant when I was there, and the explanation that I got was that for riders at that level, they still appreciate just that little bit of additional chassis stiffness. Mm. Okay, fine. Uh, you know, could... I mean, that very very well may be, um, but it just seems like such a, a case of splitting hair is that you know, to base an entire family of bikes around that seems, yeah, like maybe like a little bit of a stretch to me personally. Yeah. Um, maybe not, um, but I mean, it, we're we're not that far removed from the days when companies used to make special frames for particular riders. Yeah. And while that kind of skirts the rules a little bit, like if someone, if, if Giant were to make a Propel that was like a little bit heavier and had just like a few extra plies of carbon, but still came in under the weight limit, which it probably could. Mm. Um, yeah, would that have also have satisfied the the needs of pro riders? I, I don't know. I mean, we can definitely go in circles on this, but yeah. I just keep I just keep coming back to what could have been, and I, in my head, what could have been could have been really really awesome. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, totally agree. And as it stands, I think I look at the TCR and the Propel, and I, I see quite a bit of overlap now. And you know, you've got a lightweight aero bike, and then you've got a a lightweight aero ish bike. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's yeah I, I know there are differences there but yeah I'm I'm with you on this James I think they could have really taken to the performance enthusiast market without building an actual race bike and ended up with yeah perhaps something that looks 10 years old but rides really nicely yeah I mean you know again work for specialized uh, yeah. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, speaking of Giant, I think many listeners will be aware the company's got a sister brand just for women called Live. And you mm. picked up on something in an announcement of their new Peak Advanced 29 mountain bike. Uh, first of all, what is the Peak and what did you catch here? Yeah, so uh, it's from their uh, literal sister brand, Live, which is uh, the wi- one of the only women's only women's specific bicycle brands in the world these days. And... Uh, yeah, historically, at least in recent years, uh, Liv has released a, a handful of models that feature updated frames and concepts that hadn't yet been released in the the giant brand. So that kind of offers a bit of a teaser. So they had uh, a bike, um, again, I'm struggling to remember the name, but the equivalent of the TCR uh, quite a few years ago came out. And- the, I think it was the Avail, right? Or is that the Arrow one? I can't remember. Avail or 
Langma? Gah, you're gonna, it was the you're Langma. Gonna, Langma, it? yes. Okay. Langma. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So they they came out with that model before they came out with the the new TCR and in the previous generation, and that sort of told us what was potentially going to happen in the TCR. And I feel like they've done that again with the the peak here. So it's um, yeah, it's basically a new cross country race bike uh, which has 120 mil travel front, 115 rear. Uh, they've put a second bottle capacity underneath the top tube, which in my opinion doesn't count as a second bottle capacity, but it's there. Uh, they've kept with the vertical shock layout, but they're, they're running a, a flex pivot design, uh, which is similar to the, the current Anthem cross-country bike from Giant. Uh, but yeah, it's really the, the bump and travel, slacker geometry, uh, light, r- quite a bit of weight saved out of the frame as well. And, and I think this is kind of, perhaps a sign of what's to come for the giant anthem which is is giant's long long serving cross country race platform uh yeah still still running that vertical shock which is a little different to where most people most brands have gone but it looks good and yeah i, th- I think it'll be a, a competitive bike when it comes out um so yeah i mean the the live is out now but i think we we'll probably see a giant anthem follow suit in the next six months if if, uh if i'm guessing correctly if that i'm thinking right now seeing as how we're about to head into the meat of the season i wouldn't be surprised if we saw a new anthem being raced at sea otter next month Mm. yep so uh yeah i think that is telling and there's a lot of other cross-country race bikes coming out with uh we just saw the specialized epic and uh, i I was just gonna say well i'm leading you should mention that dave Mm. what what is the story with this new epic because there is, I guess, understandably an awful lot of buzz around this thing. It seems to tick an awful lot of boxes, so many so, so, many so that you know, uh, a really good buddy of mine, he has been looking for a new cross-country mountain bike for a pretty long time and it seems like every bike, like it comes close to what he wants yeah. and then that one came out and so he was something. like, wow. He mm-hmm. literally drove to two bike shops to look for the model that he wanted. They didn't, they didn't order any, apparently, of that specific model. The first one he went to, Went to another one that was like an hour away, waited two hours for someone to build the thing, paid full retail, stuck it in the back of his car, came home. Wow. That's commitment. That's Uh, commitment. So what is the deal with this new Epic? Why are people so so excited about it? Mostly, the reason why people are so keen on the Epic is that it's it's been around for about 22 years as a platform. Uh, And in those 22 years, it's always had uh, brain suspension, which is sort of a something uh specialized licensed and then sort of owned the patent on and it's sort of like this mechanical automatic lockout thing yeah and and 22 years it took them to uh refine it and get it to a point where it was actually fairly reactive to small bumps uh but still did its thing of remaining locked under pedaling forces but it was never perfect it was always still had a bit of a clunk to it to open up that suspension valving uh and yeah this is the first true epic race bike the the epic eight um that actually ditches the brain entirely and has gone a more traditional route of uh remote lockouts um and yeah it's just a a very interesting bike it's so i won't say it's it's groundbreaking uh i would say probably more the scott spark in its current iteration is the groundbreaking bike here but the the specialized epic has yeah gone that same way of more like being like a a very lightweight trail bike more than what you'd expect of a traditional cross-country race bike you know the geometry mimics that of a trail bike and it's got 120 mil travel front and rear uh it just looks like a very capable bike that you'd want to actually ride on trails uh all while being optimized to race world cups i mean that geometry it is pretty dramatically different from what it used to be it's Mm -hmm. what like 15 mils longer ish in reach something yep. like that and the head tube angle is what like a degree and a half slacker yeah um seat tube angle is quite a bit steeper not quite to what we see in trail bikes but they're like you know 75 and a half or something like that yep. um it is very very different uh and what i find interesting here is where we were just talking about this tcr that was seemingly pretty heavily influenced by what professional racers needed this one almost seems to me, to some extent, like it's coming from the other direction where, you know, we've talked for quite a while about how top cross-country races have gotten much more technically demanding and the bikes have had to evolve as a result. Yeah. But what is interesting is how, as a result of doing that, the bikes themselves 
even though they're ideally suited seemingly for that level of competition, they've also in a lot of ways become more user friendly because they've become more versatile as a result, right? Yeah, for sure. I, I still think these bikes are designed specifically with the racer in mind, uh, like to meet the demands of the racer. It's just that racing's well, different now. Yeah, it's just that World Cup racing has gotten so technically demanding that they're basically riding trail bikes uh, in order to you know hit the course as fast as they're going. Like they really are um, flying through these technical features, and the likes of Nino Schurter have you know increasingly raised the bar of you know, forever riding longer travel bikes and, and slacker bikes in order to gain an advantage on the descents. And it's just forced the whole field to keep up. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree. These bikes are extremely consumer friendly now. Um, and while also being quite nice for racing on, uh, it's, it's quite a rare blend, I think. And, and mountain and cross country mountain biking is doing a really good job in that sense of making, yeah, bikes that's, or forcing bikes that are, are the sort of thing that you'd actually just go out and want to ride with your buddies uh, all while being efficient enough to race at the top level. Yeah, it's really intriguing to me because it, it really wasn't that long in the past that that a World Cup cross-country race was yep. being done on hardtails mm -hmm. with you know 26 or 27 five-inch wheels yep. with Flip stems. Like 90, 100 yep. mils of suspension up front, no droppers, yep. um, like it really wasn't that far in the rearview mirror here, and now we have bikes that are so completely different from that, but yet they're going yeah. faster. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, I guess just to be clear, um, I don't want to suggest that this epic is necessarily groundbreaking in terms of the geometry. I mean, mm -hmm. like as you mentioned, they are very much, you know, kind of kind of following in the footsteps of, uh, yeah, like you said, Scott Scott with the Spark has always been pretty progressive yeah. in that. Mondraker um, is another, yeah. Yep, yep, Rocky Mountain Element. Um, so there are a handful of bikes that have, a handful of cross-country race bikes that have already been going in this direction. Mm. Um, but uh, it kind of seems like, aside from Scott, I guess this is the first big, big brand to f you know, really, really move in that direction. I mean, Trek kind of did that a little bit with the Top Fuel, um, but maybe not quite yeah. to the same extent. Um, but I, I like where this is going. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, it's impressively light and it ticks all the boxes from an ownership point of view, uh, except for the S-Works model. Uh, the cables are external of the headset. Uh, there's an optional uh, steerer bumper that, that sort of bolts to the steerer tube, but you don't have to use it. Uh, it there's a threaded bottom bracket. Like it's all normal stuff. And there's even like what the World Cup racers certainly don't need, and I'm surprised they didn't do the SOX model kind of without it, but uh, there's even a storage hatch, just like you know a lot of trail bikes and enduro bikes we've seen. So uh, you can now get rid of that ugly uh, external swap box that specializes long provided with the Epic, and you can store all your spares inside the frame, which is super cool for that style of bike. Um, yeah, I mean, Trek, again, did that with the top fuel. So again, not groundbreaking, but... Uh, yeah, it just looks like a super user-friendly bike all around. Um, not cheap. I'd say that's probably the, the big thing here. Definitely like not cheap. Specialized. Definitely not. But, but on paper, it seems like this is very much a benchmark bike for owning. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and like you said, with that, with that headset riding, by limiting that to the S-Works model, it feels mm. to me like someone actually had the wisdom to make that decision that it only made sense for that level of racer to stand the benefit of just like, you know, the handful of grams that that saves. Uh, whereas yeah. all the other ones have the partial external routing that's much, much easier to live with. I think it's actually full on, full on tube and tube guidance the whole way through. Yeah, um, probably. So like in terms of usability, like, you know, two, two big thumbs up there. Um, yeah. Also on so on the Epic, there's there's two new versions. So the the Epic World Cup that I'd previously reviewed, which is their silly sort of semi hidden shock short travel bike, uh, which runs either zero or very little sag, uh, that continues in the lineup. It's it's a very niche offering. Specialized, no, they're not going to sell a lot of those. Uh, and uh, if I'm being truthful, I hope they don't. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, so they've also so they've got the Epic Eight, which is like the all rounder race bike, um, the do it all one twenty mil travel bike. They've also got the Epic Evo, which continues, and the Evo is like their more trail oriented offering. Uh, and the 
previous iteration actually saw the Evo, uh, the Epic Evo and the Epic split into two different frames with different purposes. Uh, but it's kind of returned to being the same shared frame where the Evo now just has like a more trail oriented build. So it's got different suspension package uh, with a Fox rear shock instead of a Rock shocks. Uh, they bumped the fork travel up to 130 mil instead of 120, so that slackens out the bike. Uh, yeah, it, it looks really good. Like it, it's got you know slightly burlier tires, um, bigger brakes. Uh, but yeah, overall that looks like a very good bike too because it's built on this incredibly lightweight frame. Um, the geometry is already quite trail oriented, and uh, that bike looks a basically like what my trail bike has been for the last three years uh and it's uh it's it's very much the sort of bike i would buy for just general mountain biking oh yeah no i mean it's it's it it feels very similar in concept to the rocky mountain element carbon that i bought for myself the one that i used at break epic last year mm -hmm. uh 120 130 um you know again like very trail bikey geometry uh but that specialized i think it's like i think the frame something like a might actually be close to a pound lighter, like several hundred Perhaps. grams lighter. Mm. Uh, All while so, having space for spares inside of it. Yeah, yeah. So intriguing, very intriguing. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I got to say, I'm I'm a little bit jealous that 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 you that you've that you're the one we've got lined up to do that test for us. But you know, at some point, I, I am about to get a foot of snow on the ground here. So uh, probably yeah, makes more sense. Yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah. sticking with mountain bikes here for a bit. Uh, What's up with this new RockShox flight attendant setup here? Uh, so flight attendant, I mean, it's it's kind of the catalyst to why we're seeing and talking about all these new cross-country bikes. It seems like this is the the tech that all these bikes are waiting on. But yeah, so flight attendant came out in 2021 as RockShox's answer to electronically controlled suspension. And it was limited to in the enduro market, uh, enduro and trail bikes. Had limited success there, but I think RockShox knew all along, and I think the the re the real market forces were waiting for the cross country version, which we saw being raced last season. Uh, and yeah, that now has been released and is available. So it's uh, it's built upon RockShox's SID Ultimate platform. Uh, it requires the use of both a front fork and a rear shock, so you can't run just one; you have to have both. Uh, but yeah, it's it's using Rock uh, SRAM's Axis platform. So same batteries as their derailers and say drop a C-post. Uh, it uses the same app as as those parts. It, you, it needs the same app as those parts. Uh, but yeah, it's got that same sort of seamless experience of where you kind of just put it on the bike and you push a button and the app finds it and then you're, you're riding. It's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, and yeah, the idea is, is that they're, they're basically replacing any need of a, a manual lockout so uh you know traditionally on on cross-country bikes you'd either have a, a dial on the rear shock and front fork to to turn to increase the compression and lock out the suspension or you'd have a, a remote lockout with which is cable operated uh and and the spaghetti of cables that come with that so uh this is looking to clean that up and removes that from the bike uh fully wireless and yeah, you've got options of either having it set to full auto mode where it's doing it, it's figuring out what based on uh, your power and what the terrain is doing, what setting it needs to be in. Or you can have it on um, manual mode where you basically just have a, a left control button where you can choose what setting you want it to be with just the push of a button and it locks out both front and rear shocks simultaneously. Let me ask you this, Dave. I have not, mm. I've unfortunately not had the opportunity to ride a flight attendant bike. Yep. You have. Mm. Do you like it? I seriously do, yeah. Uh, I would not want it on a trail bike or a bike that were designed necessarily for like casual riding or, or recreational riding. Why is that? Uh, pred uh, predominantly, I mean, it's extra two extra batteries to keep con track of. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of batteries. I just did a quick count. Yeah. And like if you're running a power meter and a computer and an axis dropper and all this stuff. I think I counted what, like nine separate batteries to keep to uh, with a computer. Yeah. I think the bike I have it on might even be uh, 10 actually is not out for another week, but I think the bike I have it on is seven batteries stock. It's a lot of batteries. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so, and, and that's on an e-bike. So <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I mean, in theory, it kind of is an e-bike, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I really do like it. But for recreational riding, it it creates a stiffer riding experience because it's it's always trying to get itself back into that firmer setting uh, when required. So you sort of, yeah, there is probably a little bit more fatigue there. Uh, you can tune that. You can you can tell it not to do that. But generally speaking, at stock setting, it is going to ride more firmly than a a bike that's just being ridden in its open setting. Uh, there's the batteries. There's also the noise. So it sort of makes a similar sound to an Axis rear derailleur. But the difference is, is that noise is actually coming from in front of you, uh, you know, off the fork crown. So it's just mo- more noticeable in that sense. Uh, so and because it's so active and it's it's making, a, you know, multiple adjustments every minute. Typically, it's it's uh, a little distracting. Um, yeah, in a race situation, I, I think you would have no trouble tuning that noise out. But when you're riding by yourself, uh, you're just like, just shut up. Mm, um, so, intriguing. Yeah, but that said, it's designed for racing. And in, in that application, I think it is of true benefit. And I think it is the future of cross-country racing. Uh, I really dislike bikes with cable lockouts, like dual cable lockouts, where you have one remote controlling two cables that lock out both your front and rear shock simultaneously. I just don't like the aesthetics of it. I don't like the the servicing of it. I, I don't like the uh, often the the in, yeah, just the 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 movement required of it. For me, that left hand is so preoccupied with running a dropper post these days that also having to think about the suspension is just a a nuisance in my mind and I I, I don't get on with it that well. So uh, this solves all of that um for quite a while we were seeing i mean like for sure you know going back to like you said manual lockouts with cables and stuff or even looking at like the fox icd stuff that was Mm -hmm. a manual electronic lockout um for cannondale elo way yeah yeah or you know simon and stuff like that um so for a while we were seeing a lot of these things come up and uh because most of them just kind of didn't work that great, I feel like we mm-hmm. were seeing a lot more suspension designs where they were trying to get through mechanical means a really good blend of pedaling efficiency and bump compliance and that sort of thing. Uh, if we have something now like flight attendant, like let's just assume that becomes more prevalent or let's just assume that we have, we'll start to have brands that design bikes specifically around it. Yeah. Do you think that may open up the door to suspension designs that work better on bumps but are worse to pedal because they no longer need to be really efficient mechanically if you have something like flight attendant? Uh, 100%. I don't think it's a new thing. I think the Scott Spark has arguably been in this space for basically its entire existence where they've... Completely kept- reliant on twin lock. Yeah, completely relying on the lockout. Uh, and I think we've seen that from other bikes as well. And I think we'll increasingly see this happen on the basis that flight attendant makes every bike pedal well. Uh, the downside to this, uh, and this is quite an obvious one, is that flight attendant is a premium price point at the moment. It'll trickle down, but there's only so far it could trickle down to. It's always going to remain a premium product. Uh, and I do worry that long term it might make budget race bikes worse oh it, yeah that that's a good point because well speaking of cost you know we were just talking about how that new specialized epic is not inexpensive uh the mm. s works version with flight attendant is something like what 15k or something like that it's yeah it's it's 24 australian uh and yeah it's so a lot it's like of money 15 ish us yep it's yep. a lot of money yep mm. um I mean, it's kind of unupgradable at that price point, and for now, it's, I would argue it's not more expensive than it used to be two or three years ago, which is kind of interesting. Given that, yeah, I mean, they've replaced brain for electronics, so I mean, you're replacing one high-end proprietary tech for kind of another. But uh, yeah, it's still a lot of money. <laughs> it is an awful lot of money. Speaking of money, uh, let's shift gears a little bit here and move over to some business topics uh, because we've got some hot news in that department too. Uh, So Trek just announced that it's cutting overall spending by 10%. 
uh, and it's cutting its overall inventory volume by 20% and the number of SKUs, so basically the individual items that it sells, by 40%. Uh, layoffs are sure to be included in that 10% figure. It's unclear what that means for Trek-owned retail locations. Uh, whoa, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the word right size is being thrown around here and I think Trek themselves used it and yeah, I mean, they got too big for the current market um and perfect example I, perfect example yeah. that that amanda slr7 it comes in eight sizes which i think is great but it also yep. comes in seven colors yeah and that's just for one build kit yeah which i mean this is going to offend some people but it's a little bit bad shit uh, it is completely i mean that's a total of 56 skus for one model of bike and I have always held the opinion that Trek, uh, my perception anyway, that Trek is kind of more, it's kind of like more efficiently run than Specialized from from a business standpoint. Um, but for most of Specialized really? bikes, hmm. they only have two color options instead of seven. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. I wouldn't have put Trek as being more efficiently run than Specialized. Uh, it's an interesting. An interesting take. Either way, either way, whichever one is more efficiently run, it is quite in- interesting that one for their higher end road bike or one of their higher end road bikes would essentially offer mm. their bike only in a couple of colors, and then the other brand has yeah. it in seven. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean it, it's a it's a very necessary change and one that arguably has come late in the piece, and uh, there's a reason, yeah, why they're desperately making moves to to counter this bloat i guess but it's uh yeah i i i think it'll only help their sales having fewer choices i Um, I think so too yeah i think giving consumers that much choice can actually hinder sales and i think there's a lot of research around that and uh i think yeah long term they'll they'll be better off for this and certainly it's retailers will have a an easier time of trying to stock and sell the bike because can you imagine like being a bike shop and i know a lot of trek shops are now actually their own so it's a direct subsidiary kind of model and vertically integrated but can you imagine the likelihood of having say the right model of a monda for a customer that walks in <laughs> wanting you know a 54 centimeter a monda what group set do you want tram force yeah we've got that for you We've got it in black and blue. Oh, I really wanted the red one. It's like, it's like if you I've just remove black and a blue, few of those options. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I, I wanted it in blue, but do you have the light blue or the dark blue? Oh, no, yeah, we've, got exactly. it in, we've got it in the middle blue. Oh, that's not the one I wanted. Yeah, exactly. It's like if you give the customer the choice, they're going to want the bike that isn't available. So, yeah, I think just going the way everyone else does it, which is off, offer a bike in black and maybe one, maybe two other color choices. Uh, gives you a far greater chance of of selling the bike you have. So uh, I'm all for it. I would say related to this, I have heard rumors that perhaps some consolidation of retailers is coming, which is very interesting because Trek spent a lot of money buying existing shops and paying goodwill on those shops and then often completely renovating them uh, and rejigging them to be Trek concept shops. So if within two, three years of making all these moves, they're looking to consolidate them, that's that's some serious write-offs going on there. Yeah, there's definitely some some big league accounting going on at the moment here. Um, I mean, I, obviously we wish Trek well, and we hope that the layoffs are pretty minimal because I think yeah. most of us have far too intimate knowledge of that sort of experience. Um, but you know, Trek says that they haven't met their sales goals in 15 months, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they've been losing money for the last 15 months, but it just says that they haven't hit their targets. Um, mm. But like you said, I mean, it's a pretty big shock, and that 10% is a big, big number when it's when it's overall spending. And then again, like yeah. the, 40, the 40% reduction in SKUs. Um, but surely that will result in a healthier company long term. Fingers crossed. Um, yep. And yeah, I guess we'll just keep an eye out for what happens here. But eek! How many uh, rechargeable battery accessory boxes do you think they'll they'll sell? Do you think it'll be enough to offset all this? <laughs> uh, Dave is referring to a new charging station thing that 
Trek just announced. They sent me a sample a few weeks ago. That I, oh, I you've wasn't got really one. expecting it. It's basically sort of just like this plastic bin with a bunch of charging plastic cords. Bin. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's basically what it is. But like with a bunch of charging cords and like little compartments on the inside of it and like this flip top lid. It's designed to it's have this aesthetic. little convenient station to recharge all of your stuff. You know, all nine of your batteries on your S Works Epic or whatever. Um, but uh, it is quite expensive. Um, mm. Kind of neat. Very expensive. Uh, it's kind of just, its sole purpose is to reduce clutter. So rather than having a nest correct. of cables on a desk like I have, uh, they actually they actually shared photos of what they're trying to solve. And it, it kind of seemed like someone had snuck into my office and uh, taken a photo without my permission. But Yours and mine both, Dave. You've seen my garage. Yeah. Uh, so. yeah. so, uh, you know, like not having a USB charger on a desk with wires coming out, you just have this this little neat box. It's quite neat, but yeah, as you say, the price, what was it? A hundred and... Oh, it was well over a hundred dollars US. I can't remember exactly, but yeah. it was yeah, it's... pricey. Quite yeah. pricey. Uh, anyway. All right. Well, like I said, we'll keep an eye on this one. Uh, moving on to... Not on the not on the charging box, on track. Yes. You mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on. Last bit of business news here. Um, Fizari. It's a US-based consumer direct brand that's been around since 2005. Um they they actually make quite a lot of quite nice bikes. Uh, in, in fact, I actually own one. Uh, I bought one of their fat bikes, uh, I think, a couple of years ago now. Um, but the, well, I'd say the explanation They've behind- They've had cutbacks as well. They have? Well, who hasn't at this point? Um, they, they they cut the Fez out of the Fizari. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they cut over 50% from their name. <laughs> yeah, so Fizari, like I'd say the biggest impediment for a lot of people against their bikes was just that Fizari name. Uh, and I've heard various explanations for where that Fizari name came from. And none of them seem very satisfactory as far as uh, like a real good explanation. But anyway, uh, the company has yeah, it now- always, It's always reminded me of like a cheap take on Ferrari. Oh, Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, but the company has now announced a rebranding. It's now just going to be Ari, A-R-I. Uh, and it's supposedly a reference to uh, the Japanese translation of Ari, which is to be. Uh, and oh. the company says that it is a, quote, reflection of the company's global vision and goal to create exceptional experiences one rider at a time. And I just want to point out that creative or create exceptional experiences, all three of those words are capitalized. So just FYI. Um, mm, important. Anyway, new logo, new branding, that sort of thing. I'd say it's very, very long overdue because like I said, the bikes seem like they've been pretty good, uh, certainly incredible pricing. And hopefully this will kind of get them out of that stigma of like what's with the uh, what's up with the weird brand name. Do you have any insight as to exactly why they changed the brand name? Is it specifically to to get rid of that stigma, or is there perhaps some some copyright trademark issues associated? I don't think there are any trademark issues. Uh, my understanding is Frazari has been, uh, if not completely exclusively, definitely predominantly U.S. based as far as their market availability, and it sounds like they're trying to expand internationally um, and. Yeah, some sort of like vaguely sort of Italian esque sounding name probably wouldn't play very well in Europe. Um, yep. So Ari is much more kind of ambiguous, and I think it can. It, there's more flexibility in in what that name could be or could mean in terms of their marketing potential. So I think overall, I think that makes much more sense. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I'm a little. I'm somewhat surprised that it took almost 20 years for them to do that. Although at this point, you know, they've got 20 years of brand equity behind Fizari and then they're just... It kinda... blows my mind that that brand is almost 20 years old. I, right? It's amazing. 2005. Do not associate that brand with having that much history to it. I mean, a lot of that I think has to do with the fact that, you know, again, you're in Australia. It's been almost yeah. exclusively a US thing. Sure. Um, but again, like, you know, their bikes seem like they've been pretty good. It's like, you know, great value. Um, maybe this really is going to open the door for them to be a more global brand, um, we'll see. I mean, I haven't heard a ton as far as them being, you know, insanely overstocked and, you know, over leveraged and stuff like that, like a lot of co other companies have been, unfortunately, over the pandemic. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, hmm. Yeah. Maybe and, maybe, and maybe they'll yeah, offer stickers and, to, to existing companies to just cover up the Fez. I was just going to make that comment. I was going to say, yeah, for anyone with the Fazari, you can update it to the new model with some tape. So it's... 
very much thinking alike on that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a quick break here. Turdown under winner, Raban Sapale winner, Giro stage winner, three times uh, Ardesh. You know, you, you you did have an amazing career. Did you feel that you could walk away when you could, or was that with like going back to that two years ago? Was that a, a difficult decision first? And in some ways, were you almost like trapped into thinking that you were such a high profile rider, you were such a good rider that this is what you do and this is what I have to keep doing? No, when I stopped in 21, I I feel like I didn't have a choice, to be honest. Okay. I was extremely unhealthy mentally, physically. Um, I, yeah, when I look back, I really, yeah, I didn't have a choice. I needed to stop just for my own health. So as I mentioned earlier, Ronan's not here today, but that was a clip of his Performance Process podcast that you just heard where he dives deep into all aspects of marginal gains and performance optimization. So if you're interested in going faster yourself or just want to know how pros do it, head over to your favorite podcast app, search for Escape Collective, and then look for the Performance Process episodes. Fair warning, though, our Performance Process episodes are only available in full to Escape Collective members. So if you want the full story, make sure to head over to escapecollective.com slash join to sign up. All right, back to geek warning. Hmm. Wouldn't it be funny if we did a promo for Threaded and it's just like me just making the clanging of hex <laughs> keys or something like that, and then and then we just promote Threaded that way. <laughs> there you go. I did my promo just then. We can leave that in. Dave, uh, it's time for our on your mind segment, or what's on our mm-hmm. minds and over the heads of our families. To give some historical context, which I know that you still love for that, Dave. Um, mm, I just true. I just get back from the type. <laughs> I just got back from the Taipei Cycle Show. Uh, it's always one of my favorites to attend because of you know, kind of how it presents a fuller picture. I think of the bike industry in general. Um, you got plenty of outward facing brands, but also a lot of behind the scenes OEM manufacturers and stuff like that. And uh, you know, along with I say Taichung Bike Week, the Taipei Show is basically kind of like an OEM playground. Um, yeah. And it really got me thinking quite a bit because, you know, the bike industry, I think you would agree with me, is, I mean, ultimately, when you boil it down to it, it's kind of like a fashion industry. I mean, people are kind of fickle. They want the latest and greatest. They want things to look good. Um, People like to buy into an image and this idea of small world craftsmanship and so on. Um, But the reality is that most of the mainstream bike gear that you're buying, whether it's a complete bike, some sort of hard component, soft goods, whatever, yeah, most of that is made under contract somewhere mm-hmm. else, which is often Asia. Yeah, uh, even engineered in many cases. Uh, yeah, for sure, uh, especially with composite stuff. Um, yeah. So do you think that takes away from the image that people like to create in their head? If if people were in general were more in tune with how the whole production process and supply chain works, like, I, in other words, like how much does designed in X but made in Y matter? Like if people really knew how the sausage would ma- was made, how much of an impact do you think that would have? I think if people really knew how the sausage was made, there'd be a lot more vegetarians in this world. <laughs> Dave, I got to hand it to you for being so quick with those. So good. Yeah. Uh, and I think that applies to to the scenario here, to be honest. I think there's, yeah, there's there's only so many brands that are legitimately doing unique engineering and unique design, unique manufacturing. And the others are basically... A lot of them are just licensing almost, uh, and they're just uh, facing brands, consumer-facing brands that don't really bring much to the market other than a, a brand name and a marketing story. But if you peel back the layers, you'll find that, yeah, they don't actually have that much hands-on in the creation of the product. Uh, and I think there's a, a lot of cookie-cutter product in the market as a result of that. So, uh yeah, I, I think it would have a, a big impact. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of brands that wouldn't want people to know how their brands come to be. Well, so I, I'm not meaning for this to kind of like hype up Giant specifically or anything like that, but, um, you know, so as part of that trip, we toured their factory and like it's the second time, yeah, yeah, the second time I've gotten to tour their factory, the first time was actually like this crazy, crazy in-depth, no holds barred kind of tour. Um mm-hmm. And what what kind of struck me on this trip, but also the first time I was there too, is um, there is, well, for one, it, it's pretty neat that 
a brand the size of Giant also does actually manufacture its own stuff. I mean, you can say the same thing about yeah. Merida too, because they have their own big to an factories extent. and stuff. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and then you know there are a handful of other brands who you know, make some of their stuff. Um, sure. But by and large, what's interesting about Giant and, you know, the kind of big vibe that I got there is, you know, they are not alone in being a manufacturer for other brands. I think it's no secret that Giant does manufacture frames for other brands that you've seen out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to go through the list, whatever. Um, but uh, what's, what is always striking to me anytime I've gone over there is how much pride there is over there with the fact that that company not only is a big OEM manufacturer for other brands, but they are also the outward facing brand for themselves, which is a big deal for them. That's that, like, again, there's an awful lot of pride there. Um, and they can, they can rightfully run around and say like, we actually make our own stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I would almost argue that they don't play that up enough because it just seems like this right. huge advantage that they have, like this huge thing that sets them apart that, I mean, if I were them, I'd be shouting from the rooftops about that all day long. For sure. Yeah, I mean, Giant doesn't have enough brand credibility given how exceptionally well they make bikes. They have an aluminum foundry. They make their own aluminum yeah. alloy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're arguably the the leading manufacturer of bicycles, and yet their brand, to many, in the perception is, is that they're almost second tier, which is not fair given the quality of those bikes. So... Uh, it just it, to me, it just kind of reinforces the power of marketing and the power of brand is that a, spe a specialized in a trek are often perceived as superior options when perhaps one of those is produced by giants and giants are yeah are producing a bike that's just as good. I mean, I remember when Trek was still making their carbon stuff in Waterloo, Wisconsin, but that hasn't been yeah. the case for like like almost a couple decades now. Um, yeah. But a lot of people still think that those are made in Wisconsin. A lot of people still think Pinarellos are made in Italy, so on and so forth. Um, yeah. And again, like you know, it it's it is on the one hand kind of impressive to me that the marketing is so effective that they can create this mystique about what a company is and sort of where st some of the stuff comes from. But on the other hand, it's also a little bit sad to me that they're so effective at creating that image that people believe something that's entirely the opposite of what the reality is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I think, yeah, I think it, it applies to many industries. I don't think cycling is a unique industry in this. No, uh, no, not at all. But yeah, uh, I, I think, yeah, people figuring out where their product comes from and perhaps how involved the brand is in its own design might help influence purchase in future. Yeah, like, you know, hmm, like no one wants to know that Santa's not real. Um, <laughs> all right, well, I don't want to completely just dwell on what ultimately is kind of a cynical and a little bit depressing topic. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to our PSA for this week. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, maybe it's not quite of the same vein as similar PSAs that we've done, but it is it is workshop related. And it's a recommendation that I have for anyone who does their own work at home and especially has like a nice dedicated workspace. Um because I mostly just have a suggestion that one of the, well, I guess this is certainly based on my own experience, that one of the best additions I have made to my own personal workshop is a cordless hand vacuum, like a good one, um, hmm. not not too long ago. So I've, got, I've gotten into this somewhat bad habit of browsing on Nextdoor. So I don't know if you have Nextdoor internationally in Sydney, in Australia, whatever. So it's this... It's basically sort of, the, it's this idea, the concept is that you connect neighborhoods digitally with each other. It's almost like a, it's almost sort of like a real estate based thing, uh, like sort of version of Facebook where you, you're, you're supposed to connect with your neighbors and like, you know, like get together for neighborhood gatherings and so on and so forth. But reality is just, it's a way for people to complain about stuff as, as is often the case on the internet. Um, but one thing that's kind of cool is that they have a pretty good classified section, which we also have now, by the way. Escape has its own classified section, so you can go check that out on the site. Anyway, but uh, I've gotten into the somewhat bad habit of browsing the free section of next door to see what people are just sort of giving away. Uh, and someone gave away a pre You're a hoarder. <laughs> I'm not a hoarder. My wife, my wife might say I'm a hoarder, but um, I I found a listing that someone had put up for a free Dyson hand vac that was pretty much brand new, tons of accessories, like replacement filters, all this other stuff. And they and they said that the only thing that was wrong with it was that the battery just didn't hold the charge. It would only run for like a couple minutes before it just died. And they were just like this is so eh. bolder. 
mm, or I'd say like any affluent area in general. Sure. Um, yeah. But they were just giving it away. They 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 mm-hmm. like you know said the address where they live and they were just leaving it out on their doorstep. It was, and I'm like, I got to go get that because I knew how to fix that. Uh, because I went online and ordered one of those like Ry- Ryobi aftermarket kit I was things. Say, for, did for, you put a drill battery in it? Yeah. I did. I did because I've already got a bunch of Ryobi cordless stuff and a whole mm-hmm. bunch of those batteries and ordered that kit for like twenty bucks and stuck that on there. And now I've got a battery. Now I've got a hand vac that runs for like almost hours as far as however many batteries I have. And anyway, yeah. point being, keeping that in my workshop now has boosted the cleanliness on my workshop by like a hundredfold because it's like, it's just so much less dusty and it has so much less yep. just like random crap everywhere that I used to. And if you don't have one in your workshop, that is very high on my list of recommended items to get. Yep. Um, on that topic, I've actually, of course I have, I've owned a, a handful of various shop backs and <laughs> handhelds. Uh, and Dyson is annoyingly good like you look at dyson you're like it's just you know you're paying for the brand and you're paying for a bunch of colorful plastic yeah colorful plastic and then you think like oh it's just the tesla of you know it's just the tesla of of the hand vac world or the the cordless vac world and you don't need it anymore like you know once upon a time they had an advantage but now everyone's caught up in my experience the dyson kind of is still noticeably better uh and annoyingly so because they're so expensive they are so expensive but not but when yeah, you get I've, it for free. <laughs> no, but yeah, I've used like the, say the power tool company, a bunch of the power tool company hand vacs and they're fine, but they just, they're all kind of a little bit mediocre. And then you compare them to a, like a new Dyson. You're like, whoa, this thing, this thing is actually very efficient at cleaning. Whereas the others are kind of just like half ass trying to pick up stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm not saying people should go and spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on a dedicated hand vac for the workshop, but I will say maybe do some research and don't spend $200 on one that has the same brand as your drill because you might be disappointed. Or hundreds and hundreds of dollars on hand vacs or hundreds and hundreds of dollars on multiple hand vacs as you have apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have two Milwaukee's. I had a Ryobi. <laughs> Uh, this yeah the Milwaukee M12 is disappointing avoid that one uh, the Milwaukee M18 semi disappointing after having used a Dyson uh, Dave there has been a lot of talk and chatter in our member discord channels about mm. creating some sort of fund for you to buy, Ooh, to buy tools nice. so you don't have to buy your own tools um, mm. I would still advocate for some sort of fund for you, but I would almost argue that that money should be diverted to therapy, not more tools. <laughs> so like, <laughs> Dave, you've got a problem. <laughs> um, I'm trying to figure out which one I have to keep on. Anyway. All I'll right. Never know. <laughs> well... All right, well, that pretty much wraps things up for this week's show. Some other little bits of news before we totally sign off today. Uh, Industry 9's got a range of new road and gravel wheel sets called Solix. I'm not sure if it's Solix or Solix. Uh, They're all built with existing rims, but new hubs that are basically like a road gravel-oriented version of the company's Hydra setup. Uh, And as a result of that, they've got unusually quick 0.59 degree engagement speed, like that wicked quick for a road or gravel hub. Uh, mm-hmm. Industry 9's offering them with either steel or aluminum spokes, carbon fiber or aluminum rims, lots of colors. Uh, they start at $1,300 US and the weights are as low as 1270 grams per set. So pretty intriguing. Nice. I, might, I might bring a set of those in. We'll see. Um, Posedla, um, pretty obscure Eastern European brand that makes custom 3D printed saddles. They've got a new Joy Seat 2.0. Uh, still uses a crush box that you sit on so Posedla can have a mold of your butt to uh, to custom to custom form a 3D printed saddle uh, just for you. It still uses a similar shape overall, but it's got like a narrower and shorter nose, a uh, narrower midsection, saying that it's like a little easier to move around on. Got more widths available, uh, longer relief channel, and weight is now down to 145 grams. Pretty impressive. Still quite expensive though, 490 bucks US. But I am curious. Like I think I'm actually intrigued to send Posedla a mold of my butt to see if they can make a saddle that feels good. Mm. Like and and ask for a saddle at the same time, or are you just sending them the mold? 
<laughs> That's a good question. Like maybe, yeah. maybe I'll just make a bronze version of him for, for them. <laughs> um, that saddle looks really good. It looks like a. It's very similar, I guess, in aesthetics, like a specialized power, but with a much larger central cutout. Yeah, I guess is how I describe it. And then obviously custom in terms of width and and all that. So it looks very yeah, on, comfy on paper. I I have not sat on one, but on paper it, it seems like a very intriguing product. Yeah, yeah. So again, like I I'm intrigued. I may I may look into this a little bit more. Um, hmm. Physique's got a new gravel shoe called the Vento Proxy. That's, quote, developed for competitive riders seeking race-ready features and optimal power transfer on unpaved roads, unquote. It's basically a fancy gravel shoe. It's got a laminated polyurethane and mesh upper. It's got a single BOA L12 closure, which I find kind of interesting. Yeah, it's standard features, carbon-reinforced nylon sole. They've got a full rubber outsole, which I like, so you're a little less likely to slip on uh, kind of hard surfaces. Only one width, uh, which physique suggests they'll probably be kind of narrow, all that rubber makes them kind of heavy. They're like 700 grams per pair for a size of uh, size 42s, I think. Not terribly expensive. 250 bucks, 230 pounds, 230 euros. No idea what it is in Australia. Probably like a thousand dollars. But but they come in a lot of colors. So if you're into colorful shoes, uh, maybe check those out. James, has anyone told you that you're an absolute shoe nerd? A little bit. Yeah, I am okay. a little bit of a shoe nerd. Mm. I like shoes that fit well. Industry Nine just came out with a new hub that could be very interesting for a lot of people and you spent two to three times longer talking about a, a new shoe from physique well i i guess maybe but i don't yeah. know like anyway, like when, when you're right. when you're riding a bike what do you notice more like whether your feet feel good or whether the wheels are light and you've got a point there ah. all right. <laughs> You got me there. <laughs> All right. Moving to the other end of your body, Scott's got a new Aero Road helmet called the Cadence Plus. So, of course, Scott says it's more efficient. So they're saying it's to the tune of one watt of savings at 43K per hour at zero degrees yaw compared to the previous Cadence, I believe. Uh, 22% less drag at 15% crosswinds. Uh, maybe more importantly for the fashion conscious out there, 10% lower volume for less of that mushroom effect. Uh, you also got MIPS air node pads and optional rear clip-on light. What I am particularly interested in is the optional front vent plugs, where they're like basically like shaped little foam things that you shove into the front vents to seal those off. Uh, those do supposedly save you an extra two watts. Two watts. Ronan, are you paying attention? Two watts. Uh, but they should also make the helmet a lot more weather-friendly, which uh, is particularly intriguing to me as someone who has real winter here. Uh, I think until it looks pretty good, too. Until you lose the plugs. Uh, oh, yes, until you lose the plugs, maybe. Maybe, maybe it comes with, like, a fancy carry bag or something. Uh, I also mm. think it looks pretty good, at least in pictures, from what I can tell. Uh, not too expensive. 230 bucks U.S., so I think I've got a sample coming in. So maybe stay tuned yeah, for okay. a review of that. So we'll see. Hmm. Scott uh, helmets uh, have long been underrated in in many ways in terms I agree. of weight to features to ventilation. So I agree. So yeah. um, you know, Specialized has obviously done an exceptionally good job of uh, making everyone aware that they make nice helmets because they do an awful mm. lot of them now. And I think maybe Scott's trying to follow in those foot well, following those footsteps. But I can't think of a clever pun there. Dave. Yeah, I feel like Scott's there. been there for well over a decade. It's just uh, in certain markets you don't see very much of them. No. No. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty keen to check that one out. So we'll see what it looks like. Hmm. Um, all right. Well, that will do it for this week's episode of Geek Warning. Before we close, a couple of little pieces of news of our own. I've already mentioned Ronan's Members Only Performance Process podcast, and I am obligated to describe it as performance process, even though I'm American. Uh, and don't forget, we've also got special members only episodes of Geek Warning too. This next one addresses the, I'd say, particularly hot topic of why exactly bikes are so damn expensive these days. Uh, and if you want to hear that entire episode, you'll have to head over to escapecollective.com slash join to sign up for a membership. Speaking of signing Actu up. Actual numbers are shared within this episode. I think I think this episode is going to be one of our, the biggest we've ever published in terms of uh, the amount it gets shared. We have, uh, we have a, a subject that Ronan interviewed who was particularly open with figures. Yeah. Oh, we can say it's Rob Gatellis of, of Factor Bikes is who the interview is with. So he actually makes bikes and he's was quite upfront with where the expenditure is within the company, uh, which, yeah, a surprising interview, a very good interview. 
Uh, and one that, well, we were talking about how the sausage was made. Uh, this one might ruffle quite a few feathers depending on how mm -hmm. much you spent on your last bike. Uh, sure. Speaking of signing up, just want to remind you all that Escape Collective is a 100% member-funded operation. So that means we take no ad money, like none. Uh, there's no pop-up ads, no questionable affiliate links, no ickiness in general, that sort of thing. Uh, so if you like what you're doing, you're not a member. Uh, I mean, I, I suppose we could give you a personal invitation if you really feel the need to like, get that little extra nudge to sign up. So yeah, here you go, Mark something. Like, who, anyone listening to this show whose name is Mark, your number's up. So quit pretending like you're still in college and like trying to snag an extra meal from the cafeteria and like just pay up for what you're getting here. Uh, all right. Thanks as always for listening. We'll see you next week for another episode of Geek Warning. Cheers. Cheers.